Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody have a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't sound like a good time. Are you having a good time? Very good. Well, I know I am. <laughs> so, but, but this is where it gets really good. So I'm about to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, featured presentation of the conference, and there's a reason for that. Uh, you know in the cartoons where, where I think it's Bugs Bunny or something, he's about to write something and he has a scroll and then the big long scroll falls, falls out and it's like so long it runs down the hill? Well, the person I'm about to present, a uh, list of her involvements and accomplishments and so forth would be one of those scrolls that just runs down. It's just an amazing uh, uh, amount of things that she does for this community and, and is involved in the community and uh, Alaska. But a few of the highlights are, and her, her name is Amy Ferdeen, and she is the Chief Financial Officer of of the Cook Inlet Tribal Council, but also of E-Line Media. Uh, I believe you're Executive Vice President of uh, Cook Inlet. Um, she's also heavily involved in the Upper One Games uh, uh, production company, which is the first uh, indigenous-owned uh, game production company, game publishing company in the country, maybe the world? In the country. Canada in the country. Davis. Okay, and uh, they are the producers of the Never Alone game. How many people here played Never Alone? Yeah, quite a few. And, and I play it. I love it. Uh, I'm, I've, I've always loved the kind of fantasy platformer game from from way back when. It's a, it's just wonderful. And the feedback that I get from folks is that it's it's just a joy to play. And you also. Uh, as a teacher, you end up learning, which is which is a fabulous uh, uh, sidelight or, or, or effect of, of playing a fun game. Okay, so without uh, further ado, uh, allow me to present Amy Ferdine. She's going to talk about uh, Never Alone. Well, thank you for such a warm welcome. I'm going to start off with introducing myself the traditional way. My name is Amy Ferdine. I am the daughter of Gardenia and William Schmidt. I am of shared Inupiaq and German heritage. My mother is originally from Nome. My grandmother is originally from Teller. And my great grandmother is originally from Mary's Igloo. So our roots are very deep in this community. And so that for Alaska Native people is the proper way to introduce ourselves is to acknowledge our parents because they've allowed us to be where we're at today. But I wanted to start off with a couple videos to frame out what I'm going to be talking about today. So pardon me while I toggle between um, things here. And I'm going to start off with a trailer. And many of you have probably seen this. Imanga <laughs> Kanga. Collector <laughs> <laughs> Shukravat, Utukat Kulak to it. Al Rashutat, that come a victor damn. Damn, she will never do. Moving up the rally. Shoot 
So the game is Never Alone, Kisi Maig Nikchuna. And Kisi Maig Nikchuna is the Inupiaq phrase for you will never be alone, basically. And so there's not an exact translation, but we felt it was really important that the name carry both the Never Alone, but also the Inupiaq meaning behind it. And I'll talk a little bit about why we chose that name in the presentation. But I wanted to launch um, the presentation with one of our cultural insights, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. It'd be busy, busy, busy all through the day. You get up, and you just go right to work, you know? Right to work. There's always something to do. There's never any idle time. The only idle time we had was after we eat and before we go to bed. One of the older people would just be just relaxing, laying down there and saying, you know, it'd be really nice to hear a story. And then just organically, someone would just start telling the story. Storytelling for the Nupiak people is very important because it not only created that sense of community, but is a way to pass on wisdom to the next generation. It was like TV, you know? <laughs> it was just like, it was as good as anything, you, any movie you've ever seen. And the storyteller told it so clearly that it was just as powerful as any of the greatest movie blockbusters you've ever seen. There was a reason behind the stories that we were told because they held traditional knowledge. They held things that we might need to know in life, whether it was about how to find food or how to survive, or it was about like, well-being and the importance of connecting with people and being a good member of the community. We all do stories. We all live in stories. We all tell stories to our friends and, and they need to be told. They need to be heard. All right. So I neglected at the beginning of the presentation to in introduce two of our very special characters in the game. And so we have Nuna, who's the young girl protagonist, and Upik. Um, Nuna means land in Anupiak, and Upik means owl. And so if you play the game, you kind of understand why he's associated with owls. Every time you pass a certain checkpoint and earn a certain thing, like unlocking a um, cultural insight, you'll see a little owl um, fly off and Upik's associated with the owls. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about the features in the game that highlight these type of help helpers. Um, I'm going to be telling a story today. And so this presentation really is a story. It's a story about Cook Inlet Tribal Council. It's a story about finding our mission in life. It's about finding and sustaining our mission and helping our youth connect with their culture and also helping CITC's mission really grow and sustain through video games. And so I want to talk a little bit about CITC. I don't know if a lot of you are familiar with us. Uh, but we are the regional social service or human services organization for Alaska Natives and American Indians in the Cook Inlet region. Uh, we uh, serve about 12,000 individuals every year and we connect them with opportunities through education, employment and training, recovery services, and child and family services. And we also have a social enterprise arm, but really our goal is to connect people with opportunities. Um, our mission is to work in partnership with our people to develop opportunities um, that fulfill our endless potential. And so we had, we formed that mission statement um, about, I think, 17 years ago now. But in 2009, our board went through this visioning process where we honed our vision. And now our vision is we envision a future where our people, especially our youth, the stewards of our future, have access to vast opportunities and have the ability 
a confidence and courage to advance and achieve their goals, infused with an unshakable belief in our endless potential. And one of the things we're very cognizant of is that our youth are kind of falling behind and they're falling between the cracks. And they are the ones who are going to be our leaders and be caretaking our communities in the future. So they put the youth right in the middle of our visioning statement. Uh, the board at that time also set out the traditional values that we would hold as an organization that we're interdependent, that we cannot work in isolation in the community, that we have to connect with others if we're going to be successful. We're resilient and we believe in the resiliency of our people. Uh, we are accountable. So that's really a Western term, but if you think about it in traditional village life, you know, everyone has a job that they're supposed to carry out and if they aren't they're accountable to their community members because they're harming their community so we use the Western term but it's based on a traditional value and we are respectful and each one of these values was evaluated when we started talking about how are we going to create a social enterprise that connects with our youth and sustains our mission so our board said, well, if we're going to be focusing on our youth, we want to connect with them in ways that's relevant. You know, in traditional social service and human service models, you kind of wait for people to come into your doors and you serve them in very traditional ways, giving them assistance, you know, helping them find a job. And we will always have that as a core part of our service model, but we realized that we weren't connecting with our youth. What's exciting youth today? It's technology, it's connecting with each other, and we have to kind of meet our youth where they're at. So our board said, when you work with your, our youth, you know, they set out a 25 year vision for us that we're gonna be doing it in innovative ways. And what you see here is a young man, his name's actually Kai Fredine, um, he's my son, um, but he, they, we have created a fabrication lab at Cook and the Tribal Council in our um, youth center. And so we have 3D printers, routers. Um, we actually are working on getting a 5D printer. I'm not entirely certain what that is. Um, but with the idea is that, <laughs> with the idea behind the fabrication lab is that we spark that interest in our youth to go into the fields around science and engineering. So really in hooking them with the fab lab and then bringing them into our service delivery model where they can come in after school and connect with tutoring, with each other, to cultural activities and through case management services. But we didn't want to stop there. Um, you know, we have the service delivery side through the fabrication lab and our after school activities, but we also wanted to create a business. If you've ever tried to create a business, it's hard. A lot of the good job or business opportunities in Anchorage and in Alaska are kind of taken and they're kind of expensive to start. Um, so when we started talking about this, literally we're at lunch one day at Ray's kind of saying, what are we going to do? The board has this big goal for us that within 10 years, 50% of our revenue is going to come from self-generated sources. Um, traditionally, we're about 85% funded by the federal government. Well, if we're asking our people to be self-sufficient, we can't rely on the federal government like that. We have to expand what we're doing as a nonprofit to really show that we're walking the walk that we ask our people to do. And so we were sitting around the lunch table one day and we we're talking about what has really excited our kids. And one of the things that's really kind of engaged our youth and really inspired them to stay engaged in school is Native Youth Olympics. And for those of you who don't know, Native Youth Olympics is going on in the new Alaska Airlines Center for the next few days. And so games have been a traditional way for Alaska Natives to pass um, skills like hunting skills and wisdom uh, between um, generations. And it's also actually been a long held honor to have competition between villages in these types of games. And so we knew that the kids coming out of NYO through surveys said they were more engaged in school, they felt better about themselves, and they felt more connected to their culture. So we're like, well, if we want to do, if games are great for our kids, but we want to do technology, why not video games? There was a list of why not. Um, number one, we're a nonprofit. We didn't know how to make video games. Um, but what we understood is that 
just like anything else we do in the community, that we can't do it in isolation. So we set out to find the best in the industry, someone who had aligned values and shared values. And it took us a while to find out, find our partners, but you can see we have Eline Media listed down there, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So, you know, when we started this idea, we're like, we're not sure if our board's going to embrace the idea of video games, even though they said be innovative and use technology. So when we started talking to them about this, we said, answer the question why we want to do this. So 72% of households in the US um, have computers and play video games. The average number of hours our kids are connected to electronic media, whether it's their phone, their computer, or video games, is eight hours a day. That's a phenomenal amount of time. Um, and then 92% of American teens, or 97% of American teens play video games. So this is where our kids are at. So this is where we need to be as an organization. So, and if we expand upon just kind of moving away from where our kids are at, what values we have um, that can align with video games. And this, this is a little girl from Barrow that was up there playing one of our alpha builds. Um, but video games are a natural way to tell stories. We can share our traditional stories and values through video games. It's a huge industry and it continues to grow. And there's a way to have some cross-pollination between the consumer and education market. So we felt like if we really wanted to do this, we had to find the right partner and we had to find the right people in the community to do this with. So we found our partners, Eline Media. They are the leaders in educational video games. I know how many of you have heard of Minecraft EDU. They are the distributors of that. Um, so they have the rights, even after the sale to Microsoft, to Mojang, to distribute the Minecraft EDU. They've also created GameStar Junior and GameStar Series. And so they just released their PBS GameStar Junior. And it's really, is a, it's a game that's designed, that allows kids to learn how to make games. You know, what makes a good game? They get to peer review each other and you can use it in the classroom or outside the classroom. And so when we saw they were doing cool stuff like that, we knew that they aligned with our educational vision, but we also had to make sure they aligned with our values. So we found them through a TED talk. We saw Alan Gershenfeld giving a speech on a video. We're like, well, maybe he'd want to talk to us. So they're in New York. We call them from Alaska, just cold, and say, hey, we saw your video. We want to talk to you. Can you come up to Alaska and tell us about the video game industry? Well, we thought if they could come up to Alaska in the middle of January when it's really cold, um, they might be willing to take us seriously. Um, and they actually came up to Alaska to talk us out of this. Um, the first day of our meeting was them telling us how risky the video game industry is and why we shouldn't be doing it. But then we started telling them about why we want to do it. And it was the exact same reasons why they wanted to be involved in the educational games. And just so you guys know, Eli Media may be an educational um, video game company, but they have the consumer game expertise. So Alan Gershenfield started, was at the beginning of um, Activision when there was 15 um, employees and when through his role as COO there, they grew to over 1,500. So he is their president. And then our chief operating officer is Larry Goldberg, who followed in Alan Gershenfield's steps at Activision and was their chief operating officer for many years. And so we had the game chops and we had the values aligned. Next, we had to figure out how we're going to make this work. So we knew we had the right people from the video game side, but the most important piece was that we had the right people around the table from the community. Being a Nupiak, I was really nervous when we decided to do a game on Alaska Native um, culture, in particular when we settled on the Arctic and the Nupiak stories, it made me even more nervous because this is my stories that I grew up hearing in my culture, and I didn't want to feel like I was appropriating my own culture and doing it in a vacuum. And so we gathered a group of youth, elders, and storytellers to help us vet the idea at the beginning. And here you can see a few quotes. Ishmael Hope actually ended up being um, kind of our on-staff storyteller that helped the game 
team down in Seattle really navigate some of those hard to answer questions because many of our stories are a little ambiguous and you have to know the right people to ask. Um, and so we got a lot of really good feedback. And one of the things they told us is that you cannot expect to come in once, get an idea from us, and then come in back a year later with a game. We have to be involved at every step of the process. And part of that was the strong belief that we are a living um, culture and a living people. And so this actually ended, this theme and idea that came out of our initial vetting process became one of the themes for our cultural insights. I'm gonna play that one real quick. One of the things I think a lot of people need to understand is we aren't a museum piece. The Inupiaq people are a living people and a living culture. Even though we're in northern Alaska, which covers this vast area from Nome all the way over the Canadian border, is that there is this extreme value of interconnectedness and interdependence. It's a hunting society, a gathering society, from thousands of years. This is what creates our culture. That special relationship between humans and the natural world and the animals, and that it teaches you how to have a, a society that doesn't do too much harm to the world. Love and respect for nature, for one another, for our elders, very, very fundamental value, key to, key to life. So our values are something that bind us all. The importance of sharing with one another, the importance of spirituality, and the connection to the land, our traditions, how we hunt, sharing of stories and songs and dances. I'm Inupiaq. I'm from the Arctic Ocean. Inupiaq. I am Inupiaq. It's very important to me. It's, it's who I am as a person. And we're very proud of who we are and we want to continue that. So throughout the game, we gather kind of these concerns and these ideas that we need to address through the game. And it was really hard for us to figure out how to integrate them. You can't really force an, a consumer game to feel like an educational piece. You're going to lose your audience there. And so we were very careful about how we approached it. And what we ended up doing, and I apologize, I must have, when I modified this this morning, I must have messed up the lineup, is we ended up um, first outlining how we wanted to work together as a team and as a community. And we came up with what we call the inclusive development process. And really what this is, is bringing elders, youth, uh, our culture bearers, and the entire community together to work on the game. And this is something where we didn't just check in like every six months, we had weekly calls with them. And as the game design team had questions and concerns, they would, we would have a kind of list of issues I would need to go research and I would go find the right community members to connect with them. And sometimes I would have them actually fly up if the questions were um, important enough that they would need to sit down and kind of converse with the um, community. And so they came up to Alaska over a dozen times, Barrow several times, so we knew they were very serious about the game. Um, so we had what we called those weekly calls, but we also had the green light process. And so at every green light meeting, there was the game design team, which was headed by Sean Veshi. And Sean Veshi, for those of you who ever played the Lara Croft series, that was, he was the lead creative director on those. And he was kind of semi-retired from the video game industry and he was kind of sick of making those types of games. He has two young girls and he wanted to make a game that he could feel proud of playing with his girls. And so when we told him about our process and what we wanted to do, we sent him a box of books of stories that had been transcribed from the early 40s um, to sh kind of inspire him, to kind of hook him in. And we really wanted him on our team. 
And when he saw that, he's like, this is great, but I'm not going to do it if I'm going to do it alone. He wanted people at the Greenlight Committee process from the community. So we had Ishmael Hope. I was on that. We had um, Gloria O'Neill, the president and CEO of Cook and the Tribal Council, um, in on every single Greenlight meeting. And then when certain issues were important enough, like how do you show death? In, the, in a video game when it relates to Alaskan Native culture, we would actually have people video conference in or fly into those meetings. And so once we decided on the process, um, we knew that we had a lot of work we need to do. One of the things that um, was a challenge for us is it kind of slowed down the game development process. So many times you can create a short game like Never Alone in a year. This took us over two years to do, but it was because we wanted to have the voices, right voices at the table. And so Ishmael Hope, um, during one of our uh, first sessions, really gave us a lot of good feedback on how we involve elders. And so we went up to Barrow, we worked with the Heritage um, Museum up there. We had Jenna Harchuk um, as part of our team. And what she did was connect us to several other community members. And what ended up happening is that throughout the process we had over 40 Alaskan Natives involved in the video game design process. And so these are just a picture of our few initial meetings. Um, this is um, some pictures of them going to the Smithsonian at the Anchorage Museum to kind of get hands-on look at some of the artifacts and understand how they were used. Um, and as a result, the beginning of the project, first and foremost, was inspired by our people. And so it was inspired by our art, it was inspired by our traditional stories, and it was inspired by our language and by our wisdom. And most importantly, it was built on traditional Alaska Native values. Um, when we settled on the idea of kind of a side-scrolling video game as a great way to share stories, we also wanted to make sure, and we challenged the team to say, don't just make this you know, another one of the standard platformer games. We want you to integrate interdependence. Well, you know, that's kind of hard to do. So what ended up happening is we ended up creating a game that's a two-player game, or you can play it one player. And the idea is that you have to have both characters active in the game to solve the puzzles, really emphasizing that value of interdependence. So what was amazing is once they started playing with those mechanics and how you would do it, is we then realized that our whole process around the video game development was also about interdependence. They had to trust us and be open to our thoughts and concerns around the traditional stories, the language, the right people to involve. And we had to be open to them and say, you know, that's a great story, but that's going to make a terrible game, you know, stuff like that. And there were actually a lot of those tense moments where we're like, you know, you know, we think this and they think that. And we had to work together um, with the community to kind of resolve them. And we actually had several points where the community said, well, you know, you're basing it on a story called Kanuk Sayuka. And Kanuk Sayuka is about a young man who sets out to find the source of an endless blizzard. Um, but we wanted it to be a young girl because there wasn't a lot of young girl um, kind of role models out there. And so, you know, one of the concerns of the Alaska Native community is our young boys are falling off more than our young girls. Um, and so what we decided to do was introduce the secondary character, the fox, as kind of a male character. And if you've played the game, there's a reveal later on that tells you why we thought that'd be a good idea. Um, so it's challenges like that that ended up making this a phenomenal game. Um, but also the connection to the community was really important to us. Um, you know, they went up, they participated um, in the dance festival. They actually went up last February and was there during the first whale being pulled in. So they really became a part of the community. And um, James Nagyak, um, who was our narrator on the game, actually told the team that, you know, I'm introducing you to the Nupiak culture, but you're introducing me to geek culture. And, um, it was a lot of fun because it's that kind of gentle ripping the Alaska Native um, sense of humor that I think really made the guys feel at home. Um, so these are cultural ambassadors um, that were featured in the uh, insights from the game. 
Um, they're from Barrow, they're from Anatovic Pass, they're from Ambler, um, from Anchorage. Um, and what was really amazing was the fact that so many of them came across, you know, with an open um, mind to this game. When we started, um, we, and we based the story on Kanuk Sayuka, the um, storyteller most known for telling that story is Robert Nazra Cleveland. And Robert's daughter is Minnie Gray, and she's this adorable, amazing elder um, from Ambler who's in her late 80s. And my task was to go find her. Well, I knew from you know, reading about her and you know, seeing pictures of her that she was from Ambler, so I looked and did a search there, couldn't find her there. I knew at one point she lived in Fairbanks, couldn't find her there. And six months later, I found her two blocks away from my office, literally. Um, she was living with one of her daughters who had changed her last name, so Gray wasn't coming up on any of the phone lists. Um, so it was wonderful because I was able to go down and have tea and salmon and dried fish with her and talk about the game. And the first meeting was nerve wracking. I wasn't sure, you know, she's an elder, she's in her 80s, she's probably never played a video game. What, she's, what is she gonna think? And it, what was amazing to me is we were in her apartment and she had all these great grandkids running around and grandkids there. And I was telling her about it and showing her some concept art. And she's like, well, of course you should do this. You know, my grandkids and my great grandkids are playing video games. This is how they're going to hear the story. And so I was like, yay. And so we, you know, we talked a little bit more about that and what it would entail. Um, and as the eldest surviving child of Robert Nasra Cleveland, we really wanted to make sure that she gave us the permission to use the story. So we, that was our permission. But then throughout the process, I'd have to go back to her and say, you know, you have a young, it's a young man in the story, are you okay with us changing it to a young girl? And, you know, there wasn't a fox in the story, can we add a fox? And, you know, the story's really short, can we expand it with some other little adventures? And, you know, her first response to the first suggested change was every storyteller tells the story different. They emphasize different story, parts of the story so that, you know, the person who needs to hear the message of that story you know, hears it in the way they need to hear it. So she was so amazingly supportive. Um, she and her daughter actually um, helped us through the translation of the story and clarifying different pieces of it. So the cultural ambassador piece is probably my favorite part of doing it. Um, I got to sit through um, probably about 40 hours plus of filming of our community members. So we have this wealth of um, wealth of footage now that we're going to have forever um, with our um, community members. And what's amazing was watching people like Leo down here. He's an elder from Barrow who now lives in Anchorage. And he'd get all excited. He was telling us about growing up. And then he'd break into an Upiak and we're like, well, we'll just let him go. We don't understand what he's saying, but we'll get the translation later. Um, but it was that joy on their faces as they spoke their language that told us we needed to have the Nupiak language be a part of the game. And so a key part of the game is it's all narrated in a Nupiak and we have subtitles in many different languages so that people get to hear a beautiful language and it matches up with the beautiful um, art of the game. So here's some pictures of Minnie Gray when we had a little filming session with her. This is my favorite picture because I don't think she'd ever held a game controller and she was looking, <laughs> she was looking at Sean like, what am I supposed to do with this? Um, we had so much fun. We, had, we shared a lot of laughs through all the filming sessions. And so um, we had her come over. She has a hard time getting around. So instead of flying her to Seattle, we had her come over to CITC. We recorded her at KMBA and we recorded her doing some readings. And we actually, she actually shared a lot of her old family photos, which was really special for the team. So, you know, what we discovered is that video games is a really good way to share traditional values and traditional stories. But what we found when we started going around the world promoting our game is that cultures from all around the world were interested in sharing their stories. So not necessarily just indigenous stories, but we have um, 
the uh, government from Ireland saying, how do we do this? And we've had Maori come talk to us. We're currently in talks with uh, King Kamehameha about how they might be able to do this. And then of course, all the Alaska Native communities are like, what about me next? Um, <laughs> and so it's really amazing. And what we found is this, we're calling it the start of a movement. We're calling the world game genre. And it's a genre where you can share and celebrate cultures. And so we feel very honored to be able to highlight ours as the first, but we hope that there are many more to come. So one of the things we're, we continue to do even after the launch is to really go out there and talk about you know, how you need to do these, this type of work. We've kind of set the bar really high for these types of games and we want to see that continue because we don't want people to say, oh, this is a really fun cultural game and then they go do it in isolation and don't even talk to the group they're um, portraying in their games. And so as a result, um, we have a game that's inspiring a movement um, it's built on the value of interdependence, and the gameplay reflects that value. Um, and then the game is infused with knowledge. So we have 23 cultural insights embedded in the game, and I think I heard someone over there talking about it earlier. But as you play, you unlock these insights. Um, and we don't force you to pause the fun gameplay and see it. We, you can either pause the game or you can wait till you log off of the game or you can wait till you finish the game to go watch these insights and they sometimes pertain to like the living people living culture some of the concerns the the community want to address and make known um, in, through the game but sometimes they really connect to what's happening in the game so there within the game there's this ice flow part and then we have this cultural insight called stranded and it's about this a uh, young family that was stranded out on the ice in real life and their experience in that. And there's cultural insights about the bola, and the bola is a traditional hunting tool. So as you play that, you unlock that and you get to find out what it's like. So it's like sneaking in little bits of knowledge and education, but more than anything, it's an invitation to find out more about our people. So. So how are we doing? And so, you know, we don't share these numbers widely, but our production budget um, was about $3 million. We plan on over doubling that. Um, our marketing budget is about a half a million dollars. It's hard as a startup little company to get that um, going. Um, and then what we anticipate um, coming next is we're gonna be doing a lot of other um, kind of releases on other platforms. We started off releasing on Steam for PC, Xbox One, and PS4. Now we're now out on Mac, and we plan on doing Wii U, Vita, and Shield. Um, and we're working on potentially other platforms if the cost-benefit analysis um, kind of shows that. But what we found is people are hungry for this. And so um, we have been nominated for over 75 awards um, in 2014. We recently won the British Academy Award for Best Game Debut, um, which I wish I could have gone and accepted that, but I couldn't get away from work. Um, so, you know, it's getting a lot of interest and a lot of people are playing it. This month, if any of you are um, Sony preferred customers, we're the free game load download for the month. So go out there, download us for free and play it on your PS4. Um, so, and one of the things um, I wanted to mention for those of you who might be in the education space, we are in the process of finalizing a curriculum around Never Alone. We worked with um, Chris Sino, who is formerly of UAA's education school, um, to help us develop the curriculum that aligns with the Alaska Studies curriculum. And we anticipate that coming out in the next few months. So anyone who's interested in getting a copy of that curriculum, it's free. Um, just email me. And I have some cards up here too if you want, and I'll send it to you. One thing I didn't put on here, because we're not really announcing it, it's super secret, but I'm gonna tell you guys, um, is that we are actually um, doing little mini adventures. And our first little mini adventure, and we're calling them Foxtails, is I think slated to come out in June or July. And so it's gonna be an additional hour of gameplay with more cultural insights, and it's gonna feature Nuna and Fox on a new adventure. Um, so um, this is more of um, how we are handling um, 
the, the post-launch of the game, one of the things I didn't really talk about was the creation of Upper One Games. So Upper One Games, which for those of you who didn't catch it, is a tongue-in-cheek poke at the lower 48, um, <laughs> is, was the first um, indigenous-owned video game company. Um, and we originally hired Eline to do the production, and we were going to publish but what we discovered is through the process, it was kind of like dating and we kind of fell in love with each other and we merged our companies. Um, and we merged our management structure, which was really interesting because all of our management team is women and all of their management team is men. And so <laughs> and we are now the largest shareholder in Eline Media, which is wonderful because we get exposure and we kind of expand our game portfolio like that overnight. Um, so we have a shared management structure. Um, my boss, Gloria O'Neill, not only is the president and CEO of CITC, but now she's the executive working chair of Eline Media and is involved day to day in their strategic operations. And then I get to be their CFO, which gives me a little bit of credentials with my boys who thought being an accountant was completely boring, but now I'm involved in a video game company. Um, the <laughs> The fact that Eline Media was willing to consider merging not only our companies, but the management structure, I think, really speaks to the fact that this is how you go about creating a business in partnership with people. And this is the same thing we do in our service delivery as well. As we go seek partners who are better at doing stuff than us, we learn from them, and then we combine our services to increase our impact. So I wanted to close with a few other videos and then uh, allow for some questions. Um, so this one is one of the insights from the game. And so in the game, um, there's these Northern Lights or Borealis that actually are a character in the game. And when you get to that level, you unlock this and you get to watch this. And this is, has been one of the um, cultural insights we receive the most comments and people are having a lot of fun with. So I thought I would share it. When I was young, my mom, whenever the Northern Lights came out, she just whistle. <laughs> Boy, they come alive. Just keep whistling and that aurora will just like, you know, you can almost hear it. And then she explained to me uh, a little bit later that those are children and children who've passed away when they were children. You don't want to draw them in too much, you know, is what she said, because then they could play football with your head, play Eskimo football, and that's what they want to do. They're always playing, those children up there. Don't play out without your hood on. If you had, don't have your hood on, the Aurora person is going to come down and chop your head off and play ball with your head. It wasn't like they were trying to do bad, you know? or it was like a scary story or anything like that. It was just, that's what, that's how it was. That's what it was. What was really fun about that particular insight is one of the ones we shared publicly with um, the press as we went out and we'd have these mass tours where we'd have two days of 40 interviews back to back to back. Um, and they get to hear about the game real quick and get to play it and they get to see this video well, we were um, in San Francisco, I believe was this one, and we were showing it to one of the press uh, members who was interviewing us. And then when he went to go play the game, we saw him struggling on the, you know, the part where there were Borealises. We're like, oh, what's going on? What's going on? He's like, I can't figure out how to get the hood up. I can't figure out how to get the hood up. <laughs> um, which wasn't one of the game mechanics, but it was, it was neat to see how um, they latched on to that. Um, <laughs> So, so the, um, the response from the press has been phenomenal. We've gotten some really great reviews, some of them really heartwarming. Um, if you've read the Eurogame review, it's a, the guy, the press, the um, guy who wrote it is um, Cherokee, and it said it inspired him to be a, a better person, which is what we wanted for our youth. Um, but at the same time, we got the great press that this is a really fun game to play. Um, and it's been a lot of fun to watch the Twitch feeds. And I actually waited to play from start to end um, 
so I could have a date night with my husband. Um, we played it one night together, which was a lot of fun. There's not a lot of games we can play together. Um, and then I got, I made my kids play it together and they were a little less cooperative than um, me and my husband were. Um, so the response from the community has been amazing. I know that um, some of you may have gone to our pre-launch party at Hard Rock Cafe last October. It was right during the Elders and Youth Conference. And so not only did we celebrate with community, but we brought it to the Youth and Elders Conference as our gift. And so during the session where everyone comes together, it was fun to watch the Youth and Elder react to seeing a video game that showed a young Alaskan Native girl and her face is just kind of lit up. And then we showed the cultural insights and people were whispering, I know him and I know her. And it was great to see them connect to each other. But then they came down to our booth at the Youth and Elders Conference and we saw kids who didn't know each other start playing together and start working together as a team. And that was really inspiring for us and really important for us. So I wanted to close with our um, Never Alone video that really talks about how the community feels and how the team felt about the launching of the game. With the passing of each elder, they take with them lots of pieces of information, of knowledge that perhaps uh, none of us will ever know. Changes have come so fast, and we've become so ingrained in Western media. We're not producing our own to present who we are and the way we view the world from our perspective. Even today, there are some kids who've never been on a caribou hunt. They've never had certain foods, never been out on the ocean. Our people are so rich in culture, it's hard to believe that your own kind is lacking of. That is just absolutely critical that, that we do anything and everything we can to reclaim those parts of our past that, that have seemed to have gone by the wayside. That's, that's a huge challenge. Never Alone is a video game. It's a game that's been created in deep partnership with members of the Inupiaq community, and it's an invitation uh, for players all around the world to explore the amazing values, history, and storytelling tradition of the Inupiaq culture. All over the world, there are cultures that are just not represented in video games. And many of these cultures have very powerful mythologies and stories that have survived thousands and thousands of years. They're really one generation guiding another generation through their wisdom, through the power of storytelling. The idea that we extend storytelling into player-driven storytelling, into computer and video games, is a very powerful notion for how to keep this great tradition alive and further it into the next century. We've been able to bring our community into the development and production process, where we're bringing elders, storytellers, young people, linguists from our community to be a part of the process of developing the game from beginning to end. It's an opportunity not to make a game about a community, but to make a game with a community and to have a fusion of voices in a way that really hasn't been done extensively in this medium. The visual style of the game was deeply inspired by Alaska Native art and the artist. Uh, to me, by looking at that and observing the way they work with the materials, gave me the ideas how to create the world for this game, the very soft, very beautiful world. What success looks like to me as an Alaska Native is that we create a video game where the community feels proud of it. That our young people can look at themselves and say, that's my culture. There's a connection from my generation to the next generation, to my kids' generation. And this game is gonna take it to the next level. The people have done the work They've done the research, they've spent the time with the elders, they've went out to the communities, 
and maybe this is one of the first times ever that indigenous stories can really be seen. I knew this was going to come someday, but to use it as a tool to teach, that's something else. And that is something I could say that I'm proud of being a part of. I couldn't be any happier.